Um, welcome, uh, everybody, to uh, Wimpole Street and this very special Gorkana event, Media Relations in a Post-Leveson World. Uh, I'm Jeremy Thompson. I'm Chief Executive of the Gorkana Group. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Much has been written and said about the Leveson Inquiry and how it might impact the media, but uh, tonight our, our panel of experts will extend this to how Leveson may or may not change our world, the world of public relations, for better or for worse. Here at Gorkana, we aim to, to bring the world of public relations and the media together to help answer the burning issues facing our collective future. And back in June last year, we ran a pre-Leveson event, uh, which some of you may have come to, um, at the uh, Millbank Media Centre. Uh, it was chaired by Greg Dyke, and it featured Andrew Neal, David Davis MP, Sue Douglas, and John Lloyd on the panel. Um, the panel, uh, which was dominated by, by journalists, in fact, it was, it was dominated by Andrew Neal, um, but uh, they, they, were, they were pretty much unanimous in agreeing um, that state-sanctioned press regulation would be wrong. Um, Andrew was especially vocal in his belief that the inquiry had become, uh, in his words, a grudge match for every politician that's had a run-in with a journalist. Um, we're now two months on from Lord Justice Leveson's report, but what difference has it actually made? Well, we're currently staring at a large dose of continued self-regulation, but with a light sprinkling of statutory backing. The question that we're asking tonight is, will that fundamentally change the way that the media operates? And will it impact the relationship with public relations? Well, to answer that question, I'm delighted to, we to welcome uh, Professor Richard Sambrook to chair tonight's panel discussion. Um, Professor Richard is, is on the far end, partly uh, uh, due to um, uh, some technical microphonery, um, but also because he's, uh, he felt that was where he was best placed to, uh, to corral our group of experts here. Um, he uh, uh, was, uh, for many years, Director of Global News at the BBC, um, and he joined the Cardiff School of Journalism, Media and Cultural Studies last summer as Director of the Centre for Journalism. But during his 30 years at the BBC, Richard ran the news gathering operations for five of those years and also served on the BBC Management Board for a full 10 years. However, before joining Cardiff University, he also worked as a senior media co uh, consultant on media relations with Edelman. So a media man with senior experience in PR, he's eminently qualified to answer tonight's question. And I'm now going to ask uh, you, Richard, to introduce your panel. But before you do so, I'd just like you to, uh, to give them all a uh, warm welcome to the stage and thank, thank them all for their contribution tonight. Jeremy, thank you. Uh, th thank you very much. Uh, very good to see such a full crowd of you uh, here this evening. And we do have a fantastic panel to discuss these issues uh, this evening. We've got, uh, well, the names are all up there, but Chris Blackhurst is editor of uh, The Independent and group editorial director for The Independent and Evening Standard. Uh, at the other end, we've got Ben Fenton, who's head of the live news desk at the Financial Times, but uh, until recently was media correspondent and probably sat in more sessions of the Leveson Inquiry than almost <coughs> anybody apart from Robert Jay and Lord Justice Leveson himself. Um, we've got Ian Kirby, who is Director of Media at MHP Communications, but was Political Editor of the News of the World until it was closed. And we've got Graham Shear, a partner at BLP, to bring the, uh, the legal perspective uh, into the discussion. And Jane Wilson, the CEO of CIPR, uh, is going to uh, represent the PR perspective uh, in the debate. So, um, a fantastic panel, but before we start, um, we want to get some of your views. So, um, you'll see that you all have little handsets uh, built into your, uh, into your chairs there. Uh, and we're going to take uh, three votes at the outset, and then we're going to try them again at the end and see whether the discussion has changed your opinion on anything. <laughs> so if you pick up your handset, and in a moment when I tell you, not just yet, um, press one of those buttons, one to four. So if you're in favor of statutory regulation uh, in the form that was recommended in the Leveson report, you press one. If you don't think there's any place for statute in the regulation of the press and it should be left to self-regulation, press 2. If you have a view that's kind of somewhere else, it's about independence, not statute, it's about some other form that isn't captured in those, you press 3. And if, frankly, you don't have a clue, or maybe even if you don't care, but I don't know why you're here if you don't care, <laughs> um, press 4. So uh, if we can be ready and votes open, so press your, press your buttons, 1, 2, 3 or 4. Everybody voted? Okay, can we have a quick look at that? All right, self-regulation. So a very strong, very strong view there. It should be uh, 
in favour of self-regulation, but a quarter of people think uh, there should be statute involved, and almost a quarter think there should be some other form. OK, uh, we've got another question, I think. All right, do you think that Leveson's recommendations, which of course are about a lot more than just statute, would they improve media relations and public communications in Britain? One yes, two no, three don't know or don't care. So vote now, one, two or three. You can see the numbers ticking up on the left-hand side there. There's 82 of you not voted yet. Come on, I know who you are. <laughs> Are we done? OK, there we are. All right, no. So a majority of you, 40, over 40%, don't think it's going to make any difference. OK. And then we've got one third question, I think. Should the, uh, should the public relations industry, uh, should it be in support of Leveson? Does Leveson matter to PR? Uh, and should PR support Leveson? One yes, two no, three don't know. few more of you feel strongly about this one than the last question. OK. Right. So PR should support Leveson. OK. It will be interesting to find out how that fits with the uh, answers to the previous two questions. Um, so uh, just so you know, we're going to try and divide the, the discussion into, uh, into three. We're going to come back at the end to uh, see whether any of your minds have been changed. But we're going to start off by talking about Leveson and the report and what it amounts to. Uh, then we'll move on to talk a little bit about public relations and um, media relations and public communications. And then we'll finally start to look forward to a converged world. Uh, what's that going to be like and does any of it matter anyway? So uh, just bear in mind, we'll try and uh, steer the conversation in that way. And I will try and come out to you and bring uh, questions in as we go along. We're not just going to talk amongst ourselves and, um, and then bring you in at the end. So we'll try and come and, and ask for questions and thoughts as we go along. And if you're absolutely burning to say anything, stick your hand up and I'll try and come to you. But um, Chris, I wonder if we could start with you. As editor of The Independent, you have been uh, involved to, uh, to at least some degree in the discussions that have taken place since the report was published about um, how the industry is going to respond to the report. So, so where are we now and what's happening? Um, <laughs> where are we now? Um, I want to go back to when the report was published um, at the end of November and there was um, a great deal of euphoria at the time. Um, there really was. Um, all the editors got together in Delaunay Restaurant and it was a remarkable sight. Um, editor of the Daily Star, editor of the Daily Mail, Paul Dacre was there in person, it was quite remarkable. Um, <laughs> FT, Independent, Guy, we were all there, 20 odd of us. And we agreed to pretty much everything. Um, I think from memory, Leveson had 24 recommendations, um, 24 principles, and we, we agreed them. Um, one or two exceptions, but really, honestly, they weren't very much at all. Um, there were sticking points, though. One, of, one was that we, as an industry, as editors, we weren't in favour of statute. So your answer to that question before is absolutely spot on. Um, and really, because w w w why um, was simply that we don't want um, MPs, who many of whom have reasons, good reasons, to loathe the press, to really get stuck into our industry. And we didn't think it was necessary. Um, what's happened since, and I can understand the frustration that many people have, but I would ask you to bear in mind, we are only talking two months ago and there was a two-week gap for Christmas when the whole country shut down. Um, behind the scenes have been moving fairly quickly. Um, it's extremely political. Um, the parties themselves aren't agreed. The Tories, um, they want to try and get it through without statute. Labour wants statute. The Lib Dems are being Lib Dems and sort of move around depending on what day it is. Um, but we have to get it through the Commons. Um, and uh, there's three sticking points, really, and they're really boiling down to this, which are, one is that um, Leveson said that he wanted a fast-track arbitration service. Everyone was agreed on this. Um, one of the strongest bits of Leveson wasn't Hugh Grant and Steve Coogan and Charlotte Church. It was, it was, it was the McCanns, it was Chris Jeffries from Bristol. Um, who was wrongly accused of murder. I mean, those things really struck home, and actually struck home with the press. 
Um, I mean, it was very hard for us, anyone to ignore this stuff. And you can't accuse these people of seeking publicity or wanting stardom. They were genuinely wronged and they had no form of redress. They, they could either go to the PCC, uh, so what, they get a complaint, they get a clarification, they don't get any cash. Or if they had the money, and of course they didn't, they could go to the libel courts, and they didn't, but they didn't have the money. So Leveson said, fast track arbitration. Everyone in Delaunay nodded, it, nodded at this and said, that's a great idea, let's go along with it. Unfortunately, um, uh, the uh, lawyers have got involved, and uh, quite a lot of the local and regional papers who are um, complaining like mad that that they did nothing wrong. Neither, by the way, did the Independent. We didn't hack anyone. Um, but they're saying that, look, we never hacked anyone, and suddenly we're now going to find that our readers can take us to an arbitration service, um, and we're going to end up shelling out loads of money. And, of course, times are very hard in this industry. Newspaper circulations are plummeting. Um, and they're complaining they haven't got the money. So that's one thing. The second thing is um, Leveson said we ought to be open, um, the new system ought to be open to third-party complaints. And what he meant by that was, uh, was pressure groups, um, any group really. Um, so if we write an article that might upset the Jewish community, the Jewish community can jump up and down. And you can imagine where we'd have got to say, two weeks ago with Gerald Scarf's cartoon in the Sunday Times, where that would have gone. And people are very worried about this, that this could be open season um, and allow any, any lobbying, any pressure group to tie the whole system up in knots, take a paper through a complaints procedure, when all they're doing really is expressing opinion. And then the third thing is how do you, uh, how do you guard the guardians, which is one of Leveson's phrases, which is... How do you recognise? Um, we we want a verification panel, um, which will tell the world, tell everyone in this room that the system is truly operating properly. We have a good regulatory system, and we're, the, there's a bit of rowing going on behind the scenes as to how these people should be chosen and who they should be are. But that's really where we are. And I mean, on a daily basis, I get bulletins from the working party who are meeting Oliver Letwin, Maria Miller. Harriet Harman, I've been to some of the meetings myself, and progress is being made. So we're, we're inching there, and um, we will get there. I just ask people to, to try and be patient. So, okay, so the, the inching, the negotiation carries on. I think it, it, you point out even today the, the hacked off campaign has kind of shifted by saying it would be uh, prepared to support uh, a royal charter and yeah. what's going to be acceptable. So these, you, know, you get a sense of all the parties you know, shifting around and negotiating a little bit. But ben, can I come over to you? I mean, you, you sat in, in you know, a lot of the sessions of Leveson, saw the cross-examination. Were you um, surprised by what the report contained, not surprised? And you know, from your perspective as a former media correspondent, wh where do you think it, it rests now? Is it just about political expediency, or wh what's going to happen? Well, I mean, inevitably, there's expediency involved because it's an incredibly complicated subject, and it's being done at a massively fast pace yeah. by the standards of legislation. Um, you know, the, the Leveson produced his report very quickly by the standards of official reports of this nature and the discussion on legislation has taken place, as Chris suggested really, in kind of unprecedented way, um, getting all the editors together in one room. I should imagine that hasn't happened for a very long time. But I just, I mean, I, I wanted to wonder if I could just risk losing the audience by reading a bit of the Leveson report. Is that okay? I mean, well, probably better at the start than the uh, end. Only a little bit. <laughs> it's much, a long how, report. How many hundred pages? Less than 1%. Okay. No, it's okay. It's just one, one paragraph, actually. This is what... Uh, actually, first of all, can I just take a straw poll? Who thinks they understand what statutory underpinning means in the context of the Leveson report? About eight people out of 300. Okay. This, this is basically what statutory underpinning is from the Leveson report. In order to meet public concern that organisation by the press of its regulation is by a body which is independent of the press, independent of parliament and independent of the government that fulfils the legitimate requirements of such a body and can provide by way of benefit to its subscribers recognition of involvement in the maintenance of high standards of journalism 
the law must identify those legitimate requirements and provide a mechanism to recognize and certify that a new body meets them. That is the legislation that Leveson suggested for, uh, for the press. You would have thought, from some of the reaction that we've heard in, since November, that he was suggesting that the newspaper editors had to pass their copy by Downing Street every night before they could put it in the paper. It, it, I, I've been surprised by the degree to which certain parts of the press have reacted to this. I mean, my view is different, but my personal view is different from that of the FT, so I'm not representing the FT's view here at all. But my personal view is that that actually isn't too hard to swallow. But and I, mean, I don't buy the slippery slope. Uh, I was going to say, because the argument is once you've got that, then no. it can be it can Because be there are other system. bodies that are legislated, you know, which are regulated in, in that way. And if you kind of turn it around, and this is probably my favourite quote from Leveson, and the last time I should quote from Leveson, he, he wrote in this summary... Yes. There is no organized profession, trade, or industry in which the serious failings of the few are overlooked because of the good done by the many. Now, I think he's probably right. I can't think of any organization like that. And we are left in the position, and I speak from, shall we say, the, the end of the industry that hasn't, wasn't really mentioned very much in the Leveson Inquiry. We are facing being legislated against because of the actions of a few journalists. But in the same way as we're not allowed to drive any speed we want to on the motorways because some idiot will always drive at 140 miles an hour in the fog, if we have to give into a small amount of a recognition body, personally, I find that acceptable. You, personally, you, that you isn't, would, I should stress, in, that's not the FT's. You would have opinion. voted in, in favour of statute as defined in Leveson. Well, in the, in the sense that that's all that statute okay. is, right? Fine. Statute Good. is represented as being some big bugbear. Yeah. It isn't quite as it's been presented. All right. Ian, can I come to you? I mean, you had the, the, um, the paper closed from under you, as it were, um, last year. So, I mean, what, what's your feeling about the Leveson, about statute? And, and you know, you obviously it was your colleagues who were at the... Absolutely, the, uh, the eye of the storm here. Well, I mean, one of the things to, to stress is obviously we haven't, we're not going to know really until September exactly what happened at the News of the World. It's clear that in terms, simply in terms of hacking, there's less than seven out of about 250, probably actually probably about 400 journalists who worked there over the time who, who have been involved in this. But I actually think, and this is thinking more about the popular press than anything else, that, that they're at something of a crossroads at the moment. Um, they are uncertain about what they can write and what they can't. One of the things that I've learned since I've moved into communications is that when your client's in trouble, you work out what they can't say, and then everything else, you work out messages accordingly. And, and in terms of reporting, um, there are lots of... I don't think that there are... I don't think politicians are behaving any better. I, well, as we've seen from Chris Hume um, to yesterday, I don't think footballers are, are uh, behaving any better. But, you know, those stories simply aren't there. Now, there's a wider argument about what you define as a decent media, which Leveson... Um, talked about at great length, even though he didn't really rule about. But I think until there is some clarity about what is private, what isn't private, and what is in the public interest, um, our papers will be effectively neutered. And there's certainly quite a lot of evidence if you talk to the likes of um, Fraser Nelson at The Spectator, where he's had calls from politicians um, leaning on him over things that his correspondents have written. And I think in this uncertainty, people are benefiting from it who possibly shouldn't be. So, so would you like to see a much clearer definition of the public interest as a defence against, you know, what other people might, might engage yeah, in? Yeah, I don't know privacy? if I'd like to see a, a clear definition of what is and what isn't in the public interest. I mean, Sue Akers, when she gave evidence to Leveson, said that a lot of the stories that were obtained um, via payments to, to public officials amounted to tittle-tattle. Now, we don't know yet, and we won't know until the trials whether they were tittle-tattle. I know that the, some of the journalists involved in that are planning on putting up a fairly robust defence to point to the stories that they did and to say that the only way they could obtain that information is through, is through payment. So, so I, think, um, I think that there needs to be clarity on both sides so that lawyers know what is and what isn't acceptable. At the moment, we've effectively got the same position as we had before, where privacy, law is set by, privacy rulings are set by case law. So in some ways, Kate Winslet is protected, and I think that's actually a valid case. I don't think there was much of an interest to publish the, uh, the photos of her new husband sort of dressed in fancy dress. Steve McLaren was ruled against over, over questions that he had an affair. So journalists 
in the, in the popular end of the press are every day presented with stories and they're thinking, well, has any, any money gone to a public official? What can I say? Because I don't know what a judge is going to say and I think that's the real problem. And meanwhile, the industry grinds on and problems over circulation and all that continue. Okay, Graham, the lawyer's perspective here, I mean, both about the issues of statute, which is what all the debate seems to have centred on, but mm. there's much else in the Leveson report as well, and also this question of privacy and the public interest. Where, where, where do you think we should be looking? I, I have the, um, I suppose, the distinction of having acted for a vast number of the claimants um, who have brought actions for pre-publication injunctions against newspapers, as well as having been victims um, who were... Uh, successful in their claims against News International as a result of phone hacking. I should also declare that I was also hacked and, and was also a successful claimant in the phone hacking cases. Um, they all have pretty much one thing in common, uh, and that is that they were the subject of a extensive intrusion into their private lives, um, almost entirely not for reasons which we would call in the public interest. They were almost entirely the subject of that intrusion because there was a perceived commercial advantage that a newspaper could obtain as a result of an unlawful activity. Now, I don't include, and really this is what the the purpose and the point of what Leveson has actually revealed for uh, public digestion is that the vast majority of the press, the overwhelming majority of the press, were not involved in that kind of behaviour. Indeed, a lot of Ian's colleagues and himself at the News of the World were not involved in that kind of behaviour, but the behaviour itself became endemic. It became acceptable, it became structured, it became very strategised as part of the commercial endeavour of that newspaper and indeed underwrote an awful loss of the money that was made from the sales of the News of the World and other tabloid newspapers. So the question is about behaviour. And when you feed back that behaviour and the extremes of misbehaviour, it's really about how one conditions that and prevents it from recurring. And that really is what Leveson is almost entirely about. And that's where we come to in relation to the, uh, the statutory underpinning. And the excerpt that was read out at the beginning of this is quite how do you um, organise, orchestrate and under... I suppose, underpin the whole process so that it can't be the subject for abuse in the future. Because what has changed in society is the um, technology, the commercial ways in, and pressures that newspapers and other media um, operate under, and the way in which people can deliver the results in order to take advantage of those um, of the commercial opportunities. And really what Leveson, I think, having undertaken his year-long uh, investigation, came to the conclusion of is that you can't leave the situation to become a, uh, a recurring problem. You have to find a means and a structure and a strategy um, in order to prevent a recurring issue arising again, which would allow for abuse and for the abhorrent behaviour that we've seen um, from a small selection. So the issue was this, can we find a method that has that correct balance to prevent that happening again? And you know, you t we speak of statutory underpinning, and I think that the, the desire of most of those involved would be to see quite a, a light-handed process. And I think that what Leveson was seeking to do was to deliver this debate back to Parliament in a non-partisan, cross-party manner, so that the, the very thin web of what he put in place by way of his summary could be reinforced with a foundation of something that was uh, delivering that balance. Now, whether it's royal charter or whether it's statutory underpinning, what it was meant to do was to provide um, a, 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 a counterbalance to misbehaviour. I mean, you know, some people would say, do we really need more law? Because phone hacking was illegal, and if it had been enforced, it was a, cri it was a criminal act, and, and they could exactly. have been prosecuted without any, any additional law. Or, or even beyond that, the PCC Editor's Code actually covered all this kind of behaviour, but the PCC didn't enforce it. Uh, I, well, that, that is, I think, the, the nub of it. The PCC was not a regulator. The PCC was an industry 
organized um, and still is an industry organized body that is funded by um, the industry and it was absolutely woefully inadequate when it came to actually addressing this type of issue and the point was that what do you do in two circumstances what do you do where you have an organized um, uh, plan such as phone hacking what do you do when you have national or even perhaps large regional newspapers or media organizations who decide to opt out. Now, th those are the two issues. So how do you corral um, perhaps uh, them to opt in and to be subject to appropriate regulation. Now, it, it, it's interesting that there is very little between me and between perhaps the 93, as I understand it, positive thinking members of the media who wanted to adopt most, if not nearly all, of the Leveson recommendations. We all agreed about nearly all of this, but it's actually the things that we didn't agree about, which is the what-ifs. How do you prevent those people from okay. opting out? That so, was the so, question. So, so Chris Newton wants to come back in, um, doesn't he? I think we need to inject a bit of perspective here, which is, um, as great a report as Leveson is, there isn't one word in it that would prevent phone hacking occurring again. Um, the truth is that there are laws against bank robbing, against robbing banks, but people rob banks every single day. Today, I'm sure somewhere in Britain, a bank was robbed. And if people set out to break the law, and don't tell their proprietors, there is nothing in Leveson that will prevent that occurring again. And I think we need a bit of perspective, um, which is sort of sadly lost in this debate. Um, I think the truth is that um, we do need, we, we need the PCC to be more proactive, and that's, that's a given, but really what Leveson was about was a breakdown in enforcement. Um, the police did not investigate. The police had enough evidence to investigate. They did not investigate for all sorts of reasons which are not in Leveson, um, not reflected in Leveson. Um, I do think we need to keep things slightly a bit more okay. in perspective. So I, I want to get to Jane in a minute, but let me just let Graham come back. I'm sorry, when, when, when people talk about the PCC in terms of it having actually achieved something, I'm sorry, I, I entirely disagree. We, um, and I say we, me and many other lawyers would regularly make complaints to the PCC and they were entirely toothless and ineffective. And if I can just read one paragraph from, from Leveson, and we'll I think this is... report by the end of the evening. Yeah, no, we, we won't. This is just a very short one. Turning to the Press Complaints Commission, I unhesitantly agree with the Prime Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister, and the Leader of the Opposition, who all believe that the PCC has failed and that a new body is required. Mr Cameron described it as an ineffective uh, and lacking in rigour, while Mr Miliband called it a toothless poodle. The Commission itself unanimously and realistically agreed in March 2012 to enter a transitional phase in preparation for its own ab abolition and replacement. Now, the PCC um, were aware of exactly what was going on at the News of the World, investigated, and came up with a clean bill of health. I mean, that is an appalling indictment for, for self-regulation in these circumstances. Ian, briefly, I'll... Yeah, just, just to come... I remember that report because the PCC leaked it to me and I ran it in the Saturday beforehand. Um, <laughs> I do... Um, I, there's in just the, a, the World. There's just a, yeah, there's just a really practical point to make here, is if you're waiting for statute... The idea that something like this will sail through both houses three times and through committee stage at any rate um, is wrong, despite the fact that there's, you know, there's pretty broad all-party consensus. You're looking at two to three years, and the critical thing that that doesn't address is the thing that Chris is trying to edge towards, which is what do you do about the small victims? And they're the ones that will be waiting. And in fact, what needs to happen is something needs to be set up. If it's set up and running then underpinned by statute. Well, that's a separate debate. But the fact is that um, le waiting for legislation will be an excuse for inaction. OK. Jay, bring a little independent perspective and a little <laughs> balm to these troubled waters. What do you, what's your...? Well, I really do agree that um, having... I think this is about power, essentially. And so if you are a little victim, if you are trying to fight the fight against something big, it is very difficult, whether that's the press, whether that's, you know getting a complaint into Ikea, or, or whether it's anything where you're fighting big business or big media. So I think the power aspect is, is incredibly important. I hope we come back to that and the balance of power. And I, and I agree that something now to address that, waiting for statute, because I also agree, one only has to look at how long it's taking for the register of lobbyists 
to even touch statutes and even be written up in any kind of language that reflects statute. And one can see the lack of appetite for regulation within this government of any kind. Um, but I think I just want to quickly pick up on that point about, um, well, about bank robbers. It's not the same. I, I don't think one can get perspective in this way. Where it would be the same is if a profession was encouraging people to rob banks as part of their profession, and it came within what they were doing, um, and it was part of company culture, and there was an organisation, a big media conglomerate, or there was a, a listed company that had bank robbing as part of its activities, but was calling it something else. We can't get into the libel rate on this so, debate, okay? We can't. So, <laughs> so I, think, I think, you know, it's, if something is endemic and something is part of a culture, and, and what happens, what happens to bright-eyed young journalists who leave understanding codes and ethics and practice and train really hard um, and understand the law, commercial pressure comes in. And I think that hasn't been necessarily addressed by Levison. But I, I, I believe that an independent, um, free press that has <coughs> plurality is a good thing. It's a necessary thing for public relations. I think we are, I think the public is struggling with the fact that trust in the media, trust in journal, and the Edelman, Edelman Trust Barometer is probably the most recent example, is at an all time low but trust in big business is at a low, trust in banks, trust in politicians. The public doesn't really have much trust in anything. And the problem is the public, separate to that feeling of mistrust in, in, in the media and in, in journalism, believes that they are the ones that should be fighting the fight on their behalf and they should be challenging the corporate bullshit that comes out. You know, they should be challenging the things that, where there's somebody trying to pull the wool over their eyes. And so I think that's... I think Levison has tried to get to the heart of that, of, of, of balancing the need for it to be f free and plural and independent with the accountability. And on accountability, I, I, think the, I think there are many laws that are in place there that have not been enforced effectively. And if this was, if this was a justice issue, if this was the, the, the Ministry of Justice looking at, at this, and it was, it was cr similar types of crimes, but they weren't institutionalized within the media, I think we would see government acting a lot faster because people do want to be tough on crime. Why okay, is this not so coming into I, that? I want to get to those issues of trust and accountability and the wider social issues in, 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 in a moment in the next section. But let me just pa pause there. So we, we've given it a good, good kick around there. Who, who would like to come in from the audience with questions about Levison and about some of those recommendations and, and, and any questions for the panel? Come on, I'm sure there must be, uh, must be a lot out there somewhere. You can't all be that shy. Great, yes, here we are. There's a microphone just coming up. Can you just say who you are and if there's a particular panellist you want to ask a question of? Hi, hello. Sonny Taylor. I work for Lutchford APM, an agency, but in the past I've worked in both politics and law, so <coughs> I'm almost coming full circle. You've got all bases covered. Yeah. <laughs> and my, my, my question was, I'm not in favour of statutory regulation, but I wonder if the Levison and all the stuff that came out of it and the public interest in it and how much media attention it achieved has changed the landscape so much that we don't need to have statutory regulation because everyone is aware or sort of terribly aware of the excesses of what went on. And so self-regulation could work because now it's more out in the open. People know just how bad it was. And so hopefully newspapers and journalists are more careful about it going forward. Do you think job, job done, maybe? Oh, no, not, not job done, but I don't think we need to go down the statutory regulation route okay. where now hopefully there should be a, a better public pressure aspect on the worst excesses of bad journalism. Chris or Ian, do you think, do you think it's been enough to change the culture? Yeah, I, I think it's certainly the case that the press, the press was changing before Leveson. Um, uh, one example that always springs to mind was the, the sad death of Gary Speed, the footballer. Um, uh, in the past, if, if somebody that high profile had sadly committed suicide like that, um, there would have been acres and acres of speculation in the tabloid press. There was barely a word. Now you can argue, which I think is the right argument, that while it's changed, it may only be temporary. And of course what happens is, and what will happen in other areas of life, like the city and bankers who are also going through the mill, is that as generations move on, the, Levis, the, the uh, lessons of Leveson, the lessons of hacking will be forgotten. And we could, what we want to avoid is a new situation where new people come along and they're all gung-ho and they start misbehaving and here we go again. And that has happened in the past. Um, and that is one of the arguments 
arguments that hacked off use quite rightly when they call for statute. But nevertheless, I'd say that it was changing and no editor wanted to be called before Leveson. No editor, I mean, I, I can look at the press now. I mean, arguably the Sunday press, even without the news of the world, is still more neutered um, than it was before. It's just not the same. And uh, I think it's a matter of concern because uh, I think, as Ian said, that, you know, the idea that footballers aren't misbehaving. I mean, let's face it, Chris Hune was exposed by the press. It wasn't exposed by the court. He never got to court. Um, it was the press that exposed Chris Hune. Um, and we need to remember that. But um, I've no doubt it was changing. Um, uh, what we need to do, though, is find a system that's going to stand the test of time. Okay. Uh, Graham, did you want to come in on that? Yes, I, I was just going to make a, a couple of points in relation to that. I think that the, the, the Chris Hune example is an extremely important example of what the press can do and do right. However, to combine it in the sentence in relation to footballers, I mean, let's face it, the majority of what was on the front pages of the tabloid Sunday press was actually titillating stories that had no real public interest and only had a purpose in selling the newspapers and largely were in um, were intrusive into, into people's private lives that had um, absolutely nothing to do with other than getting that, that, that the, the volumes up, the volumes of sales up. Um, as to what has happened about the activities of the media and how far they have gone and whether or not there has been a change. I can tell you from the, the pre-publication side and the intrusion um, into areas which were not in the public interest, there has been a change. I would say that there is a greater sensitivity in that area and I think that the number of occasions where uh, I and my uh, fellow media lawyers have been called upon to advise over the last year or two in relation to that area have diminished. There's absolutely no doubt about that. The, the volume of um, defamation cases has probably similarly diminished. But, and this is where the but kind of comes in, one of the things that Leveson picks up on in his um, lengthy report, and I'm not talking about the summary, I'm talking about the report itself, is what happens when there are extraordinary situations or the potential for commercial advantage. And I come back to what I'd said previously. And the two examples he gave were in relation to um, the warning that he gave to the media generally at the very beginning of his investigation or of if his inquiry. And he said basically, the spotlight is on you. I will take into account whatever you do. And at and actually, in his report, he brings out two examples, and they are entirely focused upon misbehavior of the press during the course of his inquiry. And they are relating to the publication of photographs of the royals. Now, those, um, those examples were really about the press actually being seduced by the potential commercial advantage, and they knew that the spotlight was on them. So the issue there is, fine, actually, behavior has slightly changed, but what do we do when they perceive real advantage? And actually, there is also the potential for slippage, and we have seen some of that. We have seen more activity recently than previously. There's a, there's a question of, of degree here. I, I don't think there's any real... Um, dispute that there were a lot of stories run primarily for profit or for titillation but just think of a couple of legal cases that have happened in the last couple of weeks you've got three Brighton and Hove Albion players undergoing a sex assault trial you've got a Newcastle player who was um, who's, who was arrested last week or the week before um, the, the news of the world was one of the first papers to, to sort of uncover this kind of culture where young girls were drunk and often taken advantage of by football players often many of them and you know I, I think that for I think the danger at the moment is that the pendulum which swung too, swung too far towards cheap titillation easy stories has now swung too far the other way where actually where the where, where this behavior borders on criminality or if not criminality then certainly abusive position those stories aren't being covered and just to go back to another point as well about there is no desire anywhere in the media industry to keep the PCC. And one of the good things about, about what the, what the prop um, proprietors and, news editors, and newspaper editors have come up with is a new system. And whether it's codified by, a, by, a, by statute, by anything else, the point is it needs to be in and it needs to be acting. Because there is a, a, res there is a reluctance in the media themselves to go back to 
the bad old days and to go and to slip back that way. Okay. And they do know they need something to keep them there. 